Hugh Morris, I'm a neurologist and a, a researcher at UCL, so I'm a professor of clinical neuroscience. So I am the Drake Foundation Clinical Research Fellow, Etienne Lovers. I mean, head injury is very common in everyday life, so you know, head injury and the effects of head injury are extremely common. So most people at some time in their life will have had a head injury. Um, sometimes that can lead on to um, after effects, after head injury, like um, headaches, dizziness and so forth. So this is, this is very common and that's often referred to as a post-concussion syndrome. Um, we know that in some sports, like boxing, repeated head injuries seem to be associated with long-term neurological problems, so cognitive memory problems and movement problems. So in effect, a sort of mixture between dementia and Parkinson's. This is something we've known about in boxers for at least 40 or 50 years. Um, there have been recent reports in some other contact sports, so particularly people who play American football can develop similar clinical syndromes and similar brain changes at post-mortem. So the deposition of a protein called tau protein in the brain, which is similar to, well, it is the same protein that's deposited in Alzheimer's disease. That's been observed in some American football players who've had repeated head injuries. I think it's very difficult to say how widespread a problem that is. And so obviously there's interest in what might be happening in ice hockey, um, rugby, uh, football, um, uh, other sports that are contact sports and involve head injury. Well, I think overall sort of long-term effects of head injury in these other sports are probably not likely to be that frequent um, because we know that we don't have very large numbers of um, ex-rugby players or ex-football players with, with long-term problems. So it's probably not a very common problem, but it's definitely one that we need to understand better and in more detail. I mean, I think the thing is, I think concussion is not really a very well-defined term. So, I mean, really what we think about is head injuries. So a head, there's a huge spectrum of head injuries from a, a sort of relatively minor knock or blow that may just, you know, leave you with a mild headache right through to something which leads you to lose consciousness and to become unconscious for a period, to things that actually cause, you know, bleeding within the brain, which is something that's been seen in some boxers with head injury and other you know, people have falls and other types of head injury. So it's kind of a huge sort of spectrum of um, different types of, of injury. I think what we're really sort of, we, we know obviously that significant injuries with bleeding lead to significant problems. What we're really sort of focusing on is the mildest, um, the mildest forms of injury. And of course most mild head injuries people recover from completely normally and they don't have any problems at all from that. What we don't really understand is the impact of repeated head injuries and, um, and you know, what that might kind of mean long term and what the sort of safety aspects of that are. So I'm, I think there's something we don't really understand at the moment. In a way, there are sort of two aspects of this, and that really reflects the sort of study that we're doing um, at UCL in collaboration with Saracens um, Rugby Club and, and, and funded by the Drake Foundation. So the two aspects of that, one is sort of understanding what happens in a lot of detail in a relatively small number of people. So that might mean um, biological fluid tests, it might mean brain scans, it might mean detailed psychology tests, um, there might be electrical tests that, that can really map out everything that's happening in brain pathways when someone has a, a head injury, be that a relatively mild one or a more severe head injury. Obviously to do that kind type of assessment is extremely detailed and time consuming. And I think what we need to do really is to distill down what the key markers are that actually can be used by people you know, in a more widespread basis because clearly you know, doing a five hour assessment, shall we say, is not really going to be feasible or, or practical kind of for, for children playing sport or teenagers playing sport across the country. So really what we need to do is to sort of study a, a small group of people in quite a lot of detail to understand things better and help develop new markers which will actually enable you know, better assessment of people, um, you know, people around the country, around the world who are playing sport at all sorts of different age groups and all sorts of different levels. Um, so to try and sort of distill down what the key components are that can define how severe a head injury is how much time someone have resting from play and you know what um, needs to be done to sort of protect their long-term health. So 
The current study is a longitudinal biomarker study and this involves taking samples from players, saliva, urine and blood and looking for certain proteins that can be raised possibly during the concussed episode and we're trying to see whether the change in these protein levels would help us decide uh, and grade the severity of the concussion and also um, perhaps help in the long term with return to play decisions. So it's an additional tool which we'll be able to have hopefully in the diagnosis of a concussion. So the data is collected during after a match. So after the players have a match and if there's any concussed, concussed player following a match, then we will withdraw some blood, um, some saliva and some urine. And that uh, sample would be stored at the adequate uh, temperature. And in due course, that will be processed in the laboratory. You can see we can pick up those biomarkers, which we are trying to measure. So uh, that's when we would be doing a lot of the, the sample collection will be post-match. And if uh, certain periods after the match as well, so subsequent days, we will try and look at the samples. So we can look at the trend of, of the biomarkers to see where, how they rise and fall in relation to the um, concussed episode. I think um, I think one of the one of the problems is that the the main clinical markers we have are relatively crude sort of markers. So one of the things that's very helpful is when someone has memory loss that occurs around the time of the head injury. So if someone doesn't remember, someone has a head injury, they may or may not um, lose consciousness, black out. In fact, many people with head injuries don't black out, but it still may have um, caused brain changes. So just blacking out in itself is not is not the most important thing. Um, People may have things like they, they don't remember what happened for a period in that day leading up to the, to the head injury and then they may not remember what happened for a period after. So that's amnesia and particularly post-traumatic amnesia, so how long people have a memory problem after is, is actually quite a good guideline to how severe and how significant a head injury has been. But obviously that's a relatively crude, crude me measure and, and probably head injury occurs in lots of different forms, lots of different brain pathways may be involved and actually having a more precise way to pinpoint what type of injuries occurred, how significant it's been, which way the brain's been affected, I, I think is going to be really important in you know, giving people the best advice about, um, about what they need to do in terms of time off play and maybe even other sort of rehabilitation and recovery um, techniques and methods that may come in um, to deal with head injuries in the future. Well, I don't think that can be the gold standard, but it certainly would be something that would be useful, you know, obviously very useful, because that, that's the real, you know, that's one of the real problems, is in the, is in the sort of hours after a head injury, or in the day after a head injury, or at the pitch side, trying to decide how severe the problem, how severe the problem is. So that's, that's where things are, that's where, you know, things are clinically perhaps sometimes difficult, and where more information is going to help, both in sort of determining you know, whether someone's had a sniffing head injury um, and whether they should be allowed to play or not and you know, how much recovery time they're going to need. So. We're very much at the start of our study and uh, samples are yet to be processed and analysed. So trains, no, we can't comment on trains at the moment because, like I say, we're very much in the early weeks of the study and it's a longitudinal study and that's going to go over a period of um, years. So in due course, we wait with excitement and hope. Positively, we hope, uh, the study is one on concussion, so apart from looking at biomarkers, we'll be studying the concussed, concussion event itself. We would be looking at symptoms of the players and how they do recover symptomatically as well. So we'll have more information about the actual 
clinical syndrome of concussion and more information is always very helpful and useful. And the biomarker, if we can establish one that is useful in the diagnosis and added clinical tool to the diagnosis, we would be able to diagnose the problem in a much more uh, effective and manner and so therefore the robustness of the current diagnostic protocol would be improved and that's the hope as well as um, how we advise on return to play because if we can have a tool that's useful in diagnosis we can also use that tool to say how well the condition is recovered and therefore guide return to play and uh, limit any further injury to the system for the player who is concussed so when we know that they're fully recovered then we can advise better on return to play diagnosis and the overall management and like i say we'll have more information on the subject which is also always very useful i mean one of one of the um one of the issues of course is what about, so, we, so when someone has a major head injury and they, and they black out and they're removed from the pitch, then obviously that's kind of an observable and a significant thing. One of the questions is, you know, whether that's the most important thing or whether other types of head injuries people have are also important. So actually trying to measure what happens to the brain when people are playing contact sports, you know, is hopefully going hopefully to give us better information about that. Um, it, you know, some of these clinical tests, so asking people about their memory, asking about their symptoms, you know, they're very variable when you talk to people about them, they're not very objective. So actually having a test which can, you know, measure a chemical in the blood, which relates to what's happened to the brain, gives you a really objective um, measure of what's happened. Of course, we need to prove that that's better than the clinical measures. We need to kind of have a gold standard for head injury and we need to show that that's going to be useful and to add value to the assessment. Um, but I think there's a, there's, a, there's a big feeling that we do need more objective measures rather than using things that are very subjective that may be very variable between who's doing the assessment, between players, between the time you do it, the time of day, um, you know, how much sleep someone's had, all of these things may affect these sort of clinical, clinical measures. So I think there's a feeling that we need a more objective measure that would be quick and easy um, to do and, and would give us sort of more inf immediate information about the head injury. So.